Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the All Might Be Edified Discussions on Servant Leadership. I'm Keith Pankow, and I have the wonderful opportunity to be with Darius Lahutafar, and he is the driving force behind Medic Academy, and he stands as the best-selling author, a serial entrepreneur, and former executive at industry titans such as PTC and Oracle, among others. His last venture, Business Hangouts, a Google G Suite, which live broadcasting app, which many of you are probably familiar with, was acquired within just three years, boasting millions of users. Darius started as a robotics engineer before making a remarkable transition to sales, where he consistently excelled, leading to his rapid rise into management roles. At the young age of 28, he became the CEO of Schlumberger Subsidiary, managing a $10 million business. Despite his corporate success, Darius's true passion lay in the tech startups. At PTC, he led his unit from $4 million to $27 million in three years with a team of 150, all within fiercely competitive French market dominated by the salt systems. PTC outperformed its rival in its home territory. It was during this time that Darius, together with other sales leaders at PTC, built the foundation of what is now known as Medic and Medic Pick Sales methodologies. Post-PTC, Darius founded four startups, enterprise software, and internet companies, achieving two successful exits. He also contributed to the success of established companies like Agile, Oracle, and Think3. Darius's zeal for sales extended beyond Medic. He often played the role of the first salesperson, wooing both customers and top talents, securing approximately $20 million across five rounds of funding from investors. Darius holds a a Master's of Science in Robotics and Engineering from École Centrale de Paris, ranked first in the entrance exams. He also earned a certificate in organizational analysis from Stanford University as a patent holder and published author. He has guest lectured at the University of Washington in Seattle and the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., familiar with six languages. Darius worked globally and resides in California since 2009. Well, welcome, Darius. So glad to have you on the podcast today. Thank you very much, Keith. Thanks for having me. I'm just so excited to talk to you about so many of these different things. And which of of those many accomplishments do you think is your most proud achievement? Oh, that's a very good personal question, I would say. And that is my kids. That is helping my kids to become independent and successful at very young age without too much of cocooning from me. That's my biggest pride for sure. But I learned that from my professional experience and that fact that uh, of empowering and helping people, uh, whether they are, they are your team members, your younger brother as a fellow team member, or your kids is helping them to become independent and successful on their own, not helping them uh, by uh, giving them stuff. It's the you know, typical example is if someone is hungry, giving them a fish or teaching them how to fish. Yeah, I love that example so much because it's just such a powerful, true example. And I love to eat fish. And so, <laughs> you know, one fish is, is good, but if I know how to fish and I can catch my own fish, it's so much more impactful. And, you know, the cocooning example of of that metamorphosis that occurs from becoming a caterpillar into a butterfly. And I think that resonates with so many of us, the, just the beautiful transition that happens when that butterfly takes flight and just goes off on its own. So it's just a fascinating process in and of itself. And what a remarkable thing to consider your kids and, and relaying all these things that you've learned and making sure that your youngsters take flight and go off on their own to transition into those as well. So I appreciate that commentary. And thanks for sharing that with us, a personal reflection like that, Darius, that's meaningful to me. Absolutely. I know you're a parent as well. And this one, the reason it it always I consider as as the best achievement is that it's hard. It's hard. The more you you love your kids at the same thing in a company, the the more you love your team members, the more you want to help them, but you don't always help them the right way. At the moment, in the moment, they may think that this is the best thing to, let's say, I mean, in a parent giving them, you know, the pocket money or you know, buying that gift for them, etc. At the moment, they may think that is a good thing to do, but later they will thank you for not necessarily doing that, but helping them so that they can afford it themselves. Oh, yeah, I, I just love that. Yeah, as 
Darius and I were getting ready. I was just telling him that I just had the wonderful opportunity of taking my daughter on her 18th birthday to Paris for the New Year celebration because she celebrates her birthday over that holiday. And it was just a wonderful experience. We in Louisiana are very proud of our French heritage. And so uh, getting to celebrate his wonderful country and, and just experience that. So we shared some opportunities and he came and visited our wonderful state of Louisiana and visited New Orleans. And so we shared some experiences and got to know each other a little bit through some personal experiences. And that was just fun for us to share that. And so that's how we got to share some of our our parenting uh, experiences as well. So it's just a fun time to get to know a little bit about each other. Now, you shared empowering as you're talking about parenting. And I, I couldn't help but go back to this diagram that you share on your website that goes back to one of your newer kind of things that you teach about in your courses, the infinite sales leadership. And I think that's a good place to transition to some of the things that you teach in your courses. And just to describe it to the listeners that can't see it, you've got this infinity symbol, infinite sales. So there's definitely some good kind of branding going on there, which is, I I think anybody in the marketing, branding, sales world can appreciate that transition from infinity to infinite sales. And then you you know the title, the infinite sales leadership, and then it's a cyclical system with three things, recruiting, empowering, and optimizing. And then in the middle, the team building cycle with infinite sales. And it's just a powerful symbol to me because I'm a big proponent of team building, servant leadership. And so, you know, anything that can push a team building towards infinity, that's powerful symbology to me. And especially with those labels, recruiting, empowering, and optimizing. So talk to us a little bit about how you came up with that and where that kind of takes you. That's a a great question. You know, the thing which has been driving my courses has been my own experience. And I think if you ask questions from our audience, learners, and executives who have been through my courses and workshops, the number one thing which comes out as the thing they appreciate is how practical are my courses. I am not a uh, traditional motivational speaker or someone who has done studies of psychology or literature so that you can have a very good speech, for instance. That's not me. My success has been built thanks to the doing part as a practitioner, as a doer. And I am sharing my experience. I am sharing what is working. Very often we call them nuggets, a series of little tips and tricks here and there, like recipes, like a chef who would be sharing recipes of best food. And the details are very important, the practical details. So back to your question, it comes from experience. That's one thing. The other thing that I observed while delivering all these courses and workshops, either in person or through Zoom, I noticed that in the past 20 years, the quota attainment, which is the way we measure success for salespeople, is decreasing consistently year after year in the past 20 years, while exactly at the same time, the same period of time, sales automation tools and technologies are more and more available. Huge companies like Salesforce have noticed double-digit growth in the past 20 years every single year. So in one hand, we are having a lot more technology and tools available for salespeople. And the other hand, their quota attainment and the success is decreasing. <laughs> what the hell is happening? <laughs> <laughs> and and not many people ask this question. Not not no one seems to to worry about that. I do. So that's where I come with this a new program, the Infinite Sales Leadership. Why? Because I'm observing sales leaders, and I see that they are not necessarily doing things. And we are having a new generation, of course, come in taking leadership positions and. They are not necessarily looking into the right tools or like right methods and right practices. So these are the two main reasons why I thought it's, it's time for me to just share what I've been doing in the past 30 years, what I've learned, those practices, which have been the reason for my success. I'm just sharing that. 
Well, I love it. I love the way you frame that too. And that that's really helpful to think about taking these practical experiences. And of course, a little food metaphor never hurts. I really appreciate that because of thinking about uh, recipes and how we can really put together a good, you know, going back to the fish, how can we make that fish tasty now? So not only am I learning how to catch my own fish, how am I learning to make it really good? You know, continuing on this trend, I, I like where we're going with this, you know, now making a meal. And, you know, and then we've got this circle too. So not just infinite sales, but I've also got this cycle going, you know, empowering to optimizing recruiting. And so, how does this circle work that keeps my cycle infinite and continuing? Yeah. Okay. Let, let's uh, dive into that. So f- first of all, I, I thought since uh, your audience is not uh, seeing the picture, you did a great job as explaining, describing the picture with words. Fantastic. So yes, the, the starting point of the uh, cycle is recruiting. First step, we want to hire people who will be successful in this job. So we should have the right criteria. And that part of the course, I describe the criteria which are important for salespeople. Just, just to give one example, obviously we're not going to cover the whole course in here. It was one example is most sales people uh, like competition, just like athletes. They like to have to, to compete with their uh, colleagues and obviously with their competitors, other companies out there. That's where we also measure performance of salespeople. And even if they are not money oriented, many salespeople like making money, but not necessarily all of them. But the point is that their quota attainment, the achievement, which are usually counted in dollars, in revenue, in margin, in some sort of measured performance, is how they see themselves measured. Just like an athlete, doesn't matter if there is another person running side by side or they are measuring their performance uh, with the time. A sprint, how long does it take me to do a 100 meter sprint here? And that competition is a criteria that they need to live with in this job. So we have a higher chance of success if we look into people who have proven to be fine with being in a competitive situation. That's, you know, could be having sported activities in during college, at high school, or being actually a professional athlete, things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes great sense. And I really like that kind of now you've narrowed down that recruitment process and that hiring process to some interview questions that you can dial into to say, hey, we need to find someone that likes competition. And how do we identify that? And And that's better than You know, now some of those tools, the resume screening tools or the cover letter where they're they're filtering out some words. Now we've gotten through that phase, but now how do we ask the right questions to get the right fit for the person? And so, you know, whether it's for this position, we need some competition where it's for, you know, maybe my data analysts, I maybe don't want that. I want something else. And so how do I find that right fit? And so I have to ask better questions. Okay. What is the right fit? And how do I ask the right questions to get that fit? And so I, there's some good, you know, this is for sales and competition, but there's whatever our position is asking the right questions to say, hey, not every set of interview questions fits every set of position. And so I have to ask better questions to find the right fit. Absolutely. hundred percent. As a CEO and a company owner and startup, I obviously have hired salespeople, but also marketing, engineering, all sorts of positions. An engineer who is um, in charge of the software development, that competition part may not be at all something they are interested in. On the contrary, that pressure may actually hurt them and they will not perform in their job properly if they are under pressure. And that doesn't make one person a better person or worse person than another one. It's just that this person is more adapted for that job and this person is not. Good stuff. I like that a lot. It's very important to realize that what we're hiring for and what people prefer and their job preference and how we identify that to find the right fit for different types of jobs too. So interesting to think about those things. 
Right. And then the next step is em- empowering. Once we have the team, and sometimes leaders are hired themselves, meaning that they inherit a team. They are hired as a manager, as a director, as a CEO, as a CXO. So how do we deal with existing teams as a leader? And the, the course helps them identify different situations so that the leader can help the right way. Some of them are excellent performers called A players. Uh, some of them are having the right attitude. They are having the right activity. They are working hard, but the results are not necessarily where they should be. And then some have issues with activities to start with. Not only results, but also activities are not there. So the course gets into the detail of what are their expectations based on where they are from the leader, how the leader can help each of these categories in order to elevate them to a higher level. Obviously, the A player, it's hard to elevate them, but we want to maintain them. They may like the challenge so that they have this continuous momentum and dynamism. So that's something that we need to consider, giving them bigger challenges and encourage them and compensate them morally, verbally, financially, materially, whatever is appropriate in each context in order to compensate and con- congratulate A players with even bigger challenges. And then B players coach them, help them, develop them so that the hard work that they are putting into the job transforms into results. As a leader with experience, we can analyze why this person is working hard, but the results are not there. Helping them identifying those things so that they can reorient that energy and that work into a more efficient and rewarding a situation with results. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness that you've talked about to consider the different approaches that go into the different team members and how the different approaches are not always the same based on the skills, the needs, the role the team members playing, the positionality. I think that this is important and not just for salespeople, but for all of our teams to consider what is the need of that that team member on all of our teams and how do we approach them? Not all team members need the same type of approach. And sometimes the the approach we take can undermine the work that we're doing with a team member and can completely shut them down if we don't take the right approach. And so I, I really appreciate this training approach that you've designed and are taking to think about, hey, this intentionality that we're doing, it has to be designed and thought about in a way that matches the the action and the needs of that team member. Absolutely, absolutely. And the last step is actually two extremes that I identify to avoid. One extreme is that type of manager or leader who, as soon as uh, they notice someone in the team who is not performing, trying to change things or replace them, things like that. So I give tips and tricks so that they can look at themselves in the mirror so that Sometimes it's themselves and I give them tips in order to identify it as them or the the team member that to start with and to be more patient and help several times for a longer period before making any decision. And on the other extreme, those who are bothered by the fact that they are seeing and realizing that there is a team member who is not performing and they cannot make a tough decision. And I help them explain why that tough decision, they, they need to make that tough decision for the good of the rest of the team, for the good of the rest of the company. And I give here an example of a tribe. I give the example of uh, salespeople being the hunters of the tribe. A company is like a tribe and salespeople are the hunters and the rest of the tribe are inside and they are cooking, preparing or repairing tents or whatever other stuff that they're doing. And that the analogy would be, you know, HR, admin, finance, uh, accounting, engineering, things like that. The key point here is that if those hunters don't bring in meat, the tribe is not going to survive. The tribe, people are going to die. And that's exactly the same thing in business. If those salespeople are not bringing in money, the company is not going to survive. And the result of that has human 
implications for the whole company. The company needs to go through layoffs or even eventually shut down because the sales are not there. So sometimes uh, fixing a problem with one or two persons within a team is actually and unfortunately necessary to save the rest of the tribe. Yeah, that's a, a wonderful way to put it. And I love that you use the word optimizing there because optimizing that is really a great way to think about that. I have a lot of conversations with people in the auspice of servant leadership to say, we're not serving our teams or our people when we allow people to fail because then we're hurting the rest of our teams. And a lot of times people aren't in a right fit. Uh, and I love the way you framed it. When you first have a problem, take a step back and actually ask the question, is it me first before you actually start to pick on other people and, and accuse them of being the problem. So there's a gr really good reflection process built into your training, first of all. But then when you realize that someone's not a good fit, the, the right solution is to help them find the right fit where they actually belong and not just let them continue to fail because that's not real servant leadership for the purposes of this podcast. And for the purpose of what you're talking about, you know, helping the whole company succeed and continue to build a, pr a prosperous company, that's not going to help everybody else. And it's not going to continue to build what we need to promote everyone else and continue to meet the bottom line so that everyone else can continue to be servant leaders in whatever role they're providing in. So I, I like that that word optimize because if we really help to optimize everyone to their fullest potential, we're going to find their right fit in a, in a good way. So I, I think that cycle comes full circle with that. And then it goes back to recruiting when you're like, okay, how do we move you to a recruitment position of where you actually belong if you're not in the right fit? It's not just, hey, you're you're not worth something. You're just not, we don't got you where you need to be. And now we can have a conversation of maybe we move you to a different company. Maybe we move you to a different, different position. And I think that, and then like, Exactly. The of optimization, it becomes a different conversation. Exactly. And sometimes it's just attrition, a natural attrition. Yep. Sometimes the team members, no matter how good they are, they decide for any reason to leave the company. And then you need to deal with it and restart with the recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Yeah. And I love that that whole process and the way that it just becomes cyclical and, and gets you thinking about that. And then it comes back to empowerment and then it goes back to optimizing and it just keeps you thinking about that reflective process. And one of the things that you just wrote about that really, it just struck with me that I just really loved pondering and I'm still thinking about was this article you wrote about Aristotle that really gives some tools to help with that process because so many people talk about metrics, but they don't use metrics in the right way, I think, a lot of times. And I think this article that you wrote about Aristotle and how how he would approach metrics in today's world, I think, is a really good way to frame that. And so I don't want to steal any of your thunder. I've already kind of introduced it a little bit. I've teased it to the listeners. So would you uh, introduce the listeners to your approach to Aristotle in, in today's world and the use of metrics? Absolutely. So uh, we talked about the leadership. Uh, that's a new course. Sales methodology, MedPIC and Medic is something I've been doing the past seven years within Medic Academy. So uh, the Aristotle approach is an extension. Of course, it touches the leadership, but it's an extension uh, from the medic and metric and, and medpick approaches. So let's very briefly uh, mention what is a medic or medpick. Medic or medpick, these are frameworks, sales frameworks or methodologies which help salespeople, enterprise, B2B type of sales. The more the sales is complex, and there is a power base at the customer level and, you know, sales cycle that can be as long as several months. And the amounts of the uh, contracts can be several hundreds of uh, thousands of dollars or sometimes millions of dollars. Those type of sales and even, even a sale of $20,000 uh, in, in software or SaaS or enterprise sales may require different persons within the customer to decide and collaborate before they make a decision. And it may take several weeks or several months. In these situations, medic or medpick apply perfectly well. And it's a, it's a framework and methodology that helps salespeople succeed. What is it? Um, 
It stands uh, originally, it, it started with the uh, acronym M as in metrics, E as in economic buyer, D as in decision process, the second D as in decision criteria, P as in paper process, I as in identify pain, C as in champion, and C as in competition. That's medic. And you can remove one P and one C and it, it's medic. So it's a simplified version uh, for medic. So each element that I just described has a obviously a longer definition and is a concept and requires work and reflection and analysis within the sales opportunity. For instance, the economic buyer means that it's common sense. It's a lot of common sense. Economic buyer means that there is one person in the company who has the power economically, financially, to say yes to your contract. Well, you better know who that person is and hopefully meet with them. It's just common sense, right? Or champion is another person in the account, in the customer who is your advocate, the person who sells on your behalf inside the company, the person who is convinced that your solution is going to resolve their problems. That's why they need to buy from you and buy now and buy as big as possible. <laughs> Uh, so one of these elements is metrics and metrics is uh, for many of my uh, clients when in the first contact with them they have uh, doubts about uh, yeah for instance i have a lot of uh, clients in cybersecurity and cybersecurity is pretty much like selling insurance uh, because they have to invest in a lot of security software so that there is no intrusion or security issues for their company similar to you know home insurance or car insurance and they say, well, there's no metrics. Our software doesn't help them reduce time, think, do things faster or making bigger revenue. And then we have a lot of conversations, obviously, for this podcast. I, I won't have time to get into that, how even that can be quantified. So metrics is about presenting things in a quantitative way versus qualitative way. To simplify is if I am uh, selling, let's say, sales courses, that's what I do. If I say my sales courses are the best in the world, that's one statement. If I say my sales courses have allowed Amazon Web Services to divide the sales cycle by two, boom, that's with metrics. That is a much more convincing way of presenting my solution to the prospect than saying I'm the best. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate the way you explained that. And, you know, I just would add for me, I do a lot of crisis management and pollution response, and we have a hard time coming up with metrics for that. It's this very similar conversation. And how do you really quantify if you're preventing oil spills or if you're reducing the time on site for disasters? And once again, one of those hard questions that we talk a lot about and how do you come up with these good solid metrics? And so, you know, a lot of these questions people have fundamental problem sets for how do you create these quantifiable metrics for and I, but I think there's there's ways to come up with these better ways and that's why I thought this Aristotle conversation would be really good for people to consider. Now, yes. Now, Aristotle is amazing. As you know, or you may know, he has a famous book, uh, more than 2,500 years old book, which is called The Rhetoric. And the key elements of the rhetoric for the art of persuasion, that's the idea here. And he explains that people who are good in persuading us, that could be a political leader, that could be just a leader, or, or could be a salesperson. They use three elements, ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos is about creating, it's the, the root of ethical trust and credibility. And I will talk about the two other elements as well. But let's just focus for a second on ethos. When we are talking about metrics to a customer, for instance, if we continue with uh, Amazon Web Services as, as a customer, if we go with a few persons at the company who have taken the sales course. We want to we want to sell them sales course, and we can measure what has been their average 
sales cycle or the deals that they are signing. And we compare this with before, with the time before they got the training, we can make a comparison before after and then conclude that thanks to this training, they have been able to divide the time by two. This creates credibility. It's not only is more objective, it creates credibility because it shows that I know what I'm talking about. I have understood their pain and I have a solution for their pain. So that makes me credible. That's one thing. The other thing is that the salesperson, if they are not understanding the customer's problem and if they don't come with a solution which is resolving their problem, they will not be credible because they will appear like someone who just wants to sign the contract. And that's not working nowadays, thankfully. <laughs> uh, that's ethos and how numbers and metrics makes salespeople credible, helps them create trust. Next is pathos. Well, let, let's say logos, which is even easier, is, is the logic is the proof, is bringing the reason. That is another element, is that it's not that you are buying my software or my solution because it looks good, because the user interface is nice, because it comes in a beautiful box, because we are located in our headquarters in a nice place. No, these are all subjective things. You are buying it because it solves this problem by this measure. It's reduced your, again, if we go back to that example of reducing the sales cycle, it's reduced the sales cycle by two. Reducing sales cycle by two means salespeople will be available twice more time. As a result, potentially they can close twice more deals and you double your revenue. That's huge. That's a logical conclusion. That's huge. And then take this back, divide this by the price, the cost of buying your software. Then you get the return on investment and you can prove that the return on investment is actually very short. The payback period can be sometimes several weeks, only within weeks. You have your money back basically, and then you start making more money. That's a, a proof of sales. And the third one is emotions. People buy from people. Logos, the, the logic, credibility, yes, but there should be a third component, which is that empathy, that personal connection. And that we have it both with the fact that metrics has given a credibility to the person. So why do we like someone when we discuss, when we analyze that? There are reasons we like someone. It's not that we like their skin texture or the tone of the voice. It can be that too, but those are not the most important things. Things which are more important have always a reason. We like a, an artist, we like a person, we like a friend, we like our spouse for a reason. And customers like a salesperson when they are able to understand them and bring a solution to them. So metrics is understanding, quantifying their pain points and bringing a solution that improves the connection. And then we have that also in another element of, of Medic, which is the champion. Literally, we need to work with the champion, making sure that there is a human connection, that we talk often, we are available, we can help them, we can empower them in their position, giving them tools and, and, ticks and tips and, and manuals and documentation and connecting them with other customers who have been through these issues. That's how we build a relationship with that champion and with the decision makers and bring that third element, which is the empathy and likability to the equation and make a sale happen. Yeah, I just love the way that you use the teachings of Aristotle and the rhetoric to use that triangle of ethos, pathos, and logos to really kind of bring that home of you know, how do we use metrics in things that are especially hard to quantify and really think about that? And, you know, and then using kind of the teachings of, of Medic and MedPick, and I'll share some stuff in the show notes for those of us that aren't sales savvy, so you can kind of think about this much. But the I in MedPick is identify the pain, as Darius was talking about that. 
and identify the pain can mean a lot of different things for our organizations. It can be, you know, what's our problem set? What are we trying to solve? What, you know, what really is kind of causing this issue? And, you know, as we look at that, what are we trying to quantify? You know, and we're looking at that metric. So really, as Darius taught us so well, really kind of create that credibility of the metric, be able to logically explain it and connect it to that problem set, that pain point, as he taught us. And when we do that with those really, especially those things that are hard to quantify, that's when we're going to actually be able to talk to our leadership teams, talk to our partners, talk to the other organizations, the B2B, you know, other businesses that we're working with. And that's when we're going to have some connections and build the, the trust and credibility we need to, to move things along in our organizations. And I just think that's such a powerful thing to go back to that cycle that we talked about of recruitment and empowerment, and then optimization as we look at building those great teams. All right. Last question before we, I really give you some time to give some closing thoughts as we get close to finishing up today. I love these thoughts you have on teams and I wanted to kind of give you some comments there. So you said a statement to me in our prep material. If leaders understood that they, the only thing that they need to succeed is when their teams succeed, they would automatically become servants. You want to expand on that? Like, how do you build these teams that just become these amazing teams where the leaders are so focused on their teams? What do you do as a leader to do that? Yeah, it's actually, we are circling back with the very uh, first conversation we had with the kids that it's easier for everyone to, to see and notice. Of course, it applies, obviously, to team members. But the key is, is that helping them to become independent, helping them to succeed on their own, helping them so that when you're no longer there, they can do it on their own. That same thing applies to team members. And that's where we are actually serving them, helping them to learn and achieve their goals. In the case of a team, their professional goals, sometimes the goals that we have given to them or we have defined for them, helping them, achieving them. And it's win-win. They are happy. They are successful. They grow. They are empowered. They can be promoted. They can be a better person in their life. They can be a more successful professional. And we are winning as well because the team has achieved their goal and we have achieved as a team leader our goals. Uh, wonderful comments. I just love them. Well, make sure you go out and get Darius's book, Always Be Qualifying, Why the Book of Medic, MedPick. I highly recommend it. You can find it on Amazon, among other places. Uh, I'll have links to it in the show notes when this comes out as well. And then also... You know, you can find Darius on LinkedIn as well. And also he has a website too that we'll have links to in the show notes and the Medic Academy, medic.academy. And there's links to his new training as well, that infinite sales leadership, which highly recommend that that concept about the infinite sales leadership. I think even if you're not in the sales world, there's some translation and some overlap to some mini leadership concepts. And there's some good YouTube videos that I'm going to link in the show notes as well, because there's, I had a great time just watching them. And then also we'll link the new, the Aristotle article that also is linked to the Medic Academy as well in the show notes and just some wonderful content. Well, Darius, any final thoughts to close us up today? Anything you want to leave us with? Yeah, well, I'm, uh, you mentioned my book, Always Be Qualifying, and you mentioned the fact that, you know, in, in sales, we want to identify pain. Sales is not always in order to see any prospect and just sell. Sometimes, and that's why we identify pain, to see and to qualify if we have anything to sell. We should be, we at salespeople, we should be the first person to make that assessment. Uh, do we have a solution to their problem as soon as possible to identify the problem? And that already there, if every salesperson in the world would do that job, we would be in a much better world <laughs> instead of just uh, selling hard. You know, this is a comparison. Uh, it, this is a wink to always be closing a movie from a few years ago, many years ago, actually. You're too young 
to know that I'm too old. <laughs> and so that slogan, selling hard, always be closing, always selling something. No, that's not the right way. The best salespeople are those who qualify as a result. They are spending their time with the client who really wants what they want and they can be successful together, a win-win sales situation. Other than that, it was really a pleasure having this conversation with you, Kit. Thank you for having me again. Oh, it's been wonderful, Darius. I love it. Some great nuggets, as you say, of on servant leadership all throughout. So I definitely recommend you listen again and pull those out. We might have been talking about sales, but there was some lifelong nuggets all throughout this conversation. So thanks so much, Darius. Thanks to all of you for joining us. And I hope you've been edified and have a wonderful day. 